many of you have regular scheduled meetings with your chief compliance officers? All right. How many have regularly scheduled meetings with legal counsel or general counsel for your organizations? All right, that's great. How about with your chief operating officer or the equivalent chief administrative officers? And how many of you subscribe to industry publications for the industry which you work? Very good. And then last but not least, how many of you brief your board of directors on cybersecurity risk issues? All right, I get you got a good showing of hands for all these questions. So, uh, spoiler alert, I usually tell everyone what they should take away from this prior to going into it, and we'll talk, talk to each of these points. So, you know, first as Chief Information Security Officer, Officers or Chief Information Risk Officers, uh, you're going to be required to understand and articulate the business impacts of cybersecurity risks. I mean, there's no getting around it, um, but you have to do it in a way that people it will resonate with the people in your audience. You'll have to balance compliance and security. Um, and I, I put exhaustive mediocrity. And you, know, you see this in a lot of organizations where Nobody wants to prioritize, so you work on 20 different things, and even though at the end of the day you're, you're, you're dead tired, you really haven't got anything done. So you do that every day and every day and every day, and while you're getting exhaustive, you're not doing anything very well. So as executives, uh, whether you're the chief information security officer or the chief information risk officer, or even in my role as what they call the CSIRO, um, it's getting those executives to understand that we have to have a priority. There's things that we are going to realize are risks, but we still need to be able to keep that focus and um, on those things that are key risks for our organization. Number three is uh, cybersecurity controls have to be embedded in the business processes. And I think that, you know, while, you know, from a technology standpoint, you know, we, we can build things and we can put technology in place for the business to use. Uh, if it doesn't actually get into the point where it's embedded into that business process, then really it's like building a, a baseball stadium in the middle of nowhere. It's, it's great, it's a great facility, but nobody plays baseball there because they can't get to it. So you still end up having the risk because if the business isn't uh, involved in the execution of, the, uh, of that program, then it, it, it's really not doing anyone any, any good. Uh, the last thing is you're really going to have to understand where you are relative to your peers. Um, one of the first questions that I, I, I've received in just about every forum that I have at an executive level is, well, how are, how are we stacking relative to our peer group? Because if something are, as occurs as an executive and they're looking at fiduciary responsibility and they find out that their peers are at one level and they're at a different level, then they understand that they have an issue that they need to resolve. So understanding your posture or your maturity level relative to your peer group is going to be very important. And then how do you respond to an incident? And I think that this is something that's really interesting. Um, a lot of the regulators are starting to look at this uh, because what they find is that, you know, from a technology aspect, technology has very strong processes about how they would actually uh, bring systems back online. But what they find out on the business side is that from a communication standpoint, you know, who, how do you communicate to clients? How do you communicate to regulators? When do you engage law enforcement? When do you engage external counsel? All of the things that need to do have to do with the outward facing uh, image of the organization um, are lacking or non-existent. 
and that's going to be equally as important as some of the preventative measures and reactive measures that are in technology. So since there's a lot of different definitions of cybersecurity risk management, I try to baseline when I'm talking about cybersecurity risk management so that everybody is, we're all on the same page here. So it's the management of the business's legal, regulatory, operational, and client risk uh, that may result from its use of information or technology in order to bring it within its business's risk appetite. And I know that's a lot, but basically it's how that business, the business's risk, you know, whether it's legal, regulatory, and the impacts that those legal, regulatory, client uh, impacts would have um, relative to how they use information. This is about how our businesses use information and use technology. And they will always talk to you about, you know, their risk appetite. You know, what is their risk appetite statement? Are we within our risk appetite? And again, so these cybersecurity uh, processes, they have to extend beyond technology and they have to be into, embedded into the business processes. Uh, again, I can't stress this enough that, you know, whether it's vendor management, so people go, well, you have to risk rank your vendors. Well, businesses aren't risk ranking their vendors appropriately, and you're thinking you're managing the risk relative to the, you know, critical or significant vendors only to find out that the business didn't understand the questions, then you're going to still have an issue. If incident response is great if technology can bring systems online, but if I don't manage the communications, the media relations, um, you know, uh, engagement of law enforcement, engagement of external counsel on the outside, it's great that everyone's put together and brought the system back online, but I still have an image problem that's going to cause a, a reputational impact. If I put systems in place for, uh, for access control, but the business doesn't tell you how to build the roles, or what people should or shouldn't be able to do within the application, you're still going to have a, a cybersecurity risk gap. So the business has to take ownership. They need to understand where their demarcation between what technology will provide and what the business responsibility is. So the reason I put this slide here is, you know, I think that when you're, you're in the grassroots, um, a lot of my background is actually in technology, and I remember people would come up and they would say, well, we have to do this because audit told us to, or because the regulator told us to, or, you know, insert some very vague statement here. So, in general, the regulators aren't there to try to tell you how to do your job. They are looking at things from a very principled base. Uh, so... Uh, I put some, some common guidance that you see uh, within the financial realm, but I think it really extends out into other areas as well. You know, they're looking at the size and complexity of your business operations, uh, the makeup of your customers or counterparties, your products, your markets traded, or just the products that you provide to your customer base, and your access to, you know, your access, what, do you, what is your access to other organizations and companies? And, you, and I call it the market interconnectedness. So you should be managing those risks relative to your organization in a manner that would be consistent with an organization that meets these, these same criteria that you are. Again, your peer group, what is your peer group? How are they managing their risk? Uh, and then depending on your sector or regional presence, you'll have more stringent uh, controls or control requirements. A uh, good example is, you know, the OCC. Uh, they have very specific guidance around how 30 third parties should be managed, um, from contractual to um, due diligence beforehand to ongoing uh, risk assessments um, and documentation and reporting up to the board. Um, they are very specific about the controls they expect. And then I know we always talk about the NIST framework, the NIST framework, um, when, when you talk to the regulators, you know, NIST framework is something you can use. 
It's not a silver bullet. Um, it does do a good job of pulling from other um, uh, guidance documents and uh, uh, frameworks so that you can build uh, your policies and standards and minimum controls. But you know what they really want to see is that you're using some type of a framework. So these are just a few of the questions. Um, I remember it was December 2014, I was at my holiday party, and I was probably my second drink in, and the CEO of investment management comes up to me and he puts his arm around me and goes, so can what happened at Sony happen here? Um, <laughs> and, you know, I was like, happy holidays to you too. Um, but <laughs> again, it, it, it shows that, um, you know, these are board concerns. He was concerned that could they really steal his email? You know, could they really take that information and, and make it visible to the public and how would that happen? And then his second question to follow up that question was, and how do we know we haven't been hacked yet? I, I, I that was, that was my intro to my holiday party at, at my second drink. Now, of course, I was able to give him a very generic, nondescript answer given the, the, uh, <laughs> the exact timing of those questions. But again, it shows that these are the things that are the board or the executive uh, suite are thinking of. Uh, and then they look at cybersecurity differently. So, um, you know, for, for where I work, we, uh, we're considered critical infrastructure. Uh, BNY Mellon uh, custodies about $42 trillion worth of assets. So uh, if there was a cyber event there uh, and those assets became unavailable, somebody would notice. Um, but not all of the areas for which BNY Mellon does business are part of critical infrastructure. So it becomes a money, it becomes a money game. So for example, you have critical infrastructure, it has to have all these minimum controls in place. But I have another part of my business that's not critical infrastructure, and maybe they don't have those same stringent controls. So if I participate in this business over here, and I have 10 competitors, and I have to spend, let's say, a million dollars on controls because I'm connected to this infrastructure, but they only have to pay 100000 because they're not connected to any type of critical infrastructure. What is that, you know, what, what is my selling point for the extra nine hundred k that I have to spend so that I can be competitive? These are the ways, this is, this is the way executives and, and boards are looking at at cyber. They understand that it needs to be done. They understand that they have an obligation to protect the infrastructure, but they want to be very careful and pragmatic about how they actually do it. Are we speaking the same language as those we need to influence? Um, so I, I, was, I was working in the UK and I decided I wanted to come up with a new look. So I went to this big department store there called Harrods. I don't know if any of you have ever been to London, but Harrods is this huge, I, I, I've never seen such a large department store in my life where you can buy anything from chocolates to jewelry to clothing. So I went there because I wanted to get a pair of suspenders for my pants. So I go in, I go into men's department, and there's a young man standing there, so I went over to him and I said, excuse me, uh, I, I want to buy some suspenders for my pants. He kind of looks at me a little quizzically. He takes me, takes me out of the men's section, and he walks me over to the women's lingerie section. Like sitting there, I'm going, okay, well, dude, I don't think I'm going to find any suspenders here, but... <laughs> You know, I you know I browsed around for a little bit because I didn't figure he'd drop me off here. I didn't see what I needed. I left. I go to the office, so I'm explaining to uh, my colleagues there. I was like, you know, do you know where I can get suspenders for my pants? 
they start laughing. Turns out that pants in the UK are underwear and suspenders connect hosiery to your pants. So it, while it was, it did make sense to him, it, it was very much women's lingerie that I had asked for. Instead of saying I needed braces for my trousers, braces for your teeth, braces for your trousers. Needless to say, we both spoke English. He understood exactly what I said, but I did not speak the same language as him because in the UK, the UK British English is just different enough to cause those types of confusion. So <laughs> that <laughs> I will always remember from now on that braces on my teeth, braces on my trousers, they, they, they ingrained them into my head. I am, I'm very clear on the differences now. <laughs> so uh, as I was explaining before, I sit in the, in the intersection between the business, our legal and regulatory um, compliance groups. I work a lot with our operational risk teams. I work a lot with our, our client engagement teams. So one of the things that I always try to do before I go into any type of board or executive committee meeting in order to uh, get any type of resourcing, and, and that is I want to make sure that when I go in that room and all of them are sitting around the table, they're doing this. Yeah, we need to do that. We need to do that. And in order to do that, I learned very quickly that I have to talk to them about things that they actually care about. So every, every almost every regulator, uh, every regulator that I uh, regulatory authority that I know has a rule relative to internal controls saying that uh, the adoption and implementation of written policies and procedures reasonably designed to prevent a violation of whatever federal securities laws. If you actually look at a lot of the, the new regulations or anything else, they're not really cyber specific uh, regulatory um, rules. What the regulators are doing is they're saying this should be part of internal controls, just like you have internal controls for credit, uh, how you manage market risk. Cybersecurity is just another risk that you need to manage in your organization. And if you do not have written policies and procedures reasonably designed to manage that risk, then you're violating that, that rule or, or regulation for your organization. So when I talk to, um, you know, our regulatory, our legal compliance um, individuals, I talk to them about the rules relative to our organization uh, around internal controls and, you know, and then put whatever I'm trying to get accomplished in a, a proper context for the rules and the regs. But it's not just enough to do that because there could be regs or rules out there that aren't really being enforced. So to understand you know, how they're actually being enforced, working together with legal and understanding some of the, uh, the enforcement actions around uh, how that rule is actually being enforced. So uh, I'll give an example of the SEC. If you read a lot of their enforcement actions, it's because a company has created policies and standards um, and they're not following them. And, and you'll see that, I, I mean, it's a constant theme, you know, and, and what ends up happening is some organization took a template, they said these are our policies and standards, and that's all they did. So there's no line of demarcation about who's responsible for what, but if somebody asked them if we had policies and standards, they could turn around and go, yep, we sure do, here they are. Well, that's great, but if you're not doing it and you have a violation because you weren't doing it, and I see that you have policies and standards that you're not following, guess what? You violated the rule. Uh, client contracts and addendum. Oh, sorry. Huh? 
Sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. So, so, but this is where you have the balancing act. So, if you're if you're working with the board, the board really wants to know you know, how they stack up against, you know, what's our peer group? Then how do we stack up against our peer group? So whether we go out and we get a third party audit team to come in and and help us with that evaluation, or if we try to use our connections within the within the industry to figure out how we stack up, they want they want something to, that shows them that they're they're uh in line. But that can also help you say, uh, hey, we're reasonable. Because, hey, our peer groups are here. What we're doing is in line with what our peer groups are doing. So that can help us, you know, be what uh, reasonable. Right. So, so the question is, have, have, have I seen a shift between best practices and what our, our peers are doing? Um, I, I've seen a shift that says that all of our peers are doing best practices, and in that context, yes. But I don't think that the best practices are necessarily driving, um, you know, the, you know, the best practices aren't alone driving where the industry is going. And that's, and I'll say that because most of the regulators that regulate, so you'll, you'll have a regulator and let's say they, they regulate all medium size organizations, uh, financial organizations or financial, I should say banks, medium sized banks. And that regulator will go and they will see how, you know, numerous banks within that, within that, uh, sector are doing their controls and they will come in and say well yeah you're you're doing this but we looked at other banks at your same size and they're also doing this so then by you know and it may not be a finding per se it may be something that they're looking for you to do which in order you know ultimately means you need to find a way to do it but again it's really being driven by what they see our peer groups doing what they, where they see our peer groups in the implementation of specific programs. So if there's a new um, uh, guidance document out, so for example, for third party vendors, um, that raises that bar, it's like, okay, well, the bar has been raised, all your peers are here relative to how close they're coming to getting an implementation in place. Either you're here, either you're here, but again, they're still looking at you relative to your peer group uh, and driving it through your peer group. Now, all your peers have to meet that same requirement. That's true, but I don't, I don't think that from a regulatory standpoint that that requirement is driving whether you're going to be looked at doing something reasonable is going to be what the rest of your peer group is doing, even though they are driving to a minimum control standard. Um, so a couple of other things I just want to really point out on this slide is client contracts. I don't know, um, you know, outside of your third party vendors, you'll have, uh, you'll have client contracts, maybe, you know, for, from an investment st management standpoint, you, you're, you're, um, you have investment management agreements. So they're not really, they're not really third parties, they're, they're an agreement of the services that you're going to provide an organization. Um, what, what is contained in those, in those client contracts? You know, uh, indemnifications. I've seen indemnifications where they want to indemnify, uh, the, the client wants to be indemnified for all losses relative to cyber. So if anything, and, and of course the businesses are looking at these and they're the same standard agreements that they usually sign, and they don't know that, well, we've just indemnified the client for any cyber losses. We can't do that. But I bet you if you have these types of contracts that people have been signing over and over and over and over again, they don't pay attention, the client contracts are changing. Reps and warranties are changing. 
uh, rights to audit changing. Um, so do you understand what's in these client contracts and addendums that your businesses are signing? Uh, notification for, for incidents. Those are being added into these client contracts. Um, again, if the business doesn't understand their responsibility relative to uh, ensuring that we have the, you know, the right wording or agreements within these kind of contracts and addendums, if they don't realize that they have a part in managing the cybersecurity risk relative to our organization, then these types of things end up coming and biting you. And then regulatory focus. So um, while, you know, there's cybersecurity programs and everybody needs to have a cybersecurity program, uh, do you understand where your, your, your primary regulator is really focusing in on? So, um, for an example, the SEC, uh, they're really focusing in on, for investment advisors, third party vendors, access controls, and incident management. So, you know, while you are doing other things, you really need to focus on managing and, and developing your programs in these three areas. So that helps you, uh, um, uh, solidify and prioritize what you need to actually have done. And again, all of these things help when you're having a conversation with a legal or regulatory uh, individual around cybersecurity, putting your your uh, argument in the same context as what they look at really becomes very helpful. Operational impacts. And this is, you know, I talked to our, our COO, um, actually my, my, uh, my boss is the COO of uh, investment management, so we have these types of talks all the time around where does technology end, technology's responsibility end, and our business responsibilities begin. So, and then uh, if we're not doing what we need on the business end, how will that impact our operations, like what can happen. Um, so, you know, one of the things that uh, I always talk to, you know, whether there's technologists or risk assessors is, do you understand the business processes well enough to understand what's real risk and what's not? Um, you know, what, from a financial standpoint, they deal with risk all the time. Um, what we, I mean, their, their whole business is risk. They accept a certain amount of risk in order to be able to make a specific amount of profit. So it's not that they don't understand risks uh, and that they're not welcome to taking risk, but they need to have, be clear on what those risks are and what risks they may actually be managing within their business processes. So what ends up happening if you don't understand that is you end up building some type of technology, um, whether it's solution or uh, some type of technology process, only to find out that there's a supporting business, you know, reconciliation process or some type of business process that's already managing that risk for you. And what the business then sees is arduous processes. Like, why are we doing this when we're also doing this? Why do we need belt and suspenders? Why can't we just do this? And it's, a value, and it's a valid argument if they are already managing that risk through a business process that has uh, been shown to be adequate and effective. Uh, and then understanding the maturity of your, your uh, peer cybersecurity risk management program. If, if I go into uh, an executive board meeting and I say, you know what, we really need to uh, concentrate on access control. Our access control is all out of whack. Um, but we need a certain amount of funding. Oh, illuminate. Um, we need a certain amount of funding to do so. Then, and at the same time you go, but relative to our peers, we're right where our peers are. They're going to look and say, well, would that money be better served somewhere else? Or why can't I then take this money and fund some business revenue generating project? Or why can't I take this, these, this funding and, you know, whatever I have to also 
bring up to par? Why don't I spend my money there? Again, so understanding your the maturity and where your peers are becomes very important because what the board is looking at is this fiduciary responsibility to protect that organization. So how does it look if, as a board member if I, I am in line with my peers, I took, the, I took money, that, money, resources, time, effort, and I put it to even further enhance this control, but I turn around and find out you know, I had a control over here that was below uh, our industry standard, and that's where I got bit. Not saying that what we did wasn't important, but from a board member's perspective and looking at it from a fiduciary responsibility, that's going to be a problem for them. So, I, you know, one of the one of the first things that I, I recommend people to do is to understand, you know, where does my cybersecurity risk management program stack up relative to my peer group? Um, one thing that, and and I know we brought this up in the key points. So I'll touch on it here because key points was the spoiler alert, was around the incident management plans. Um, I think that this is going to be something that is becoming more and more pervasive as the shift from prevention to detection and response becomes greater and greater, is how do you actually respond in the crisis? And I think a very good example of that is Target and Anthem. If you think about the target breach and the anthem breach, it's about the same size of amount of records that were stolen. In Target, there were credit card numbers uh, and credit, you know, credit card information. On the other hand, in Anthem, you had um, whole identity, your social security number, uh, any dependents that you have. Um, it's very it's the equivalent of your, your tax return. They have everything they, they need to know to continuously recreate your identity over and over again. And Target, yeah, okay, I had to have a lot of uh, credit cards reissued uh, to people who were affected, and that had some type of cost to it. On the other hand, I have somebody who can perpetually uh, take my identity for years to come and... and um, you know, do damage to me personally. But everybody talks about Target. Everybody talks about Target. You can't go to a conference in security without somebody mentioning about Target. But very few, many, very few people actually talk about the Anthem breach. And one of the things that you'll note if you go back and you look at how Anthem actually did their incident response, they got out in front of it. They, they were apologetic. They got in front of the communications they, they, their media relations, they use social media uh, to, to keep people informed. Um, they very much control the message. So when people look at Anthem, they don't see it as the same light as Target. And if you look at the Target, they had misinformation. It was very disorganized. You could tell that you didn't get a really good level of comfort that they had the situation under control. But Again, Anthem's breach, the information they lost, much, much worse than what they lost at Target, but Target's you know, negatively impacted in the news. That goes back to crisis communication and being able to have the business know what they need to do in order to manage an incident on the outward facing, outward facing. Uh, and this is not lost on a lot of the regulators, which is why they're starting to spend more time on understanding how the business will respond in the event of an incident. So, communicating cybersecurity risk and associated impacts through a common vernacular as the individuals you are trying to influence will increase your success in gaining support. The thing is, is that as, a, as an executive, um, we have two-day sessions where people are coming in and saying, these are our priorities, this is what we need to advance our priorities for our business. Sitting there, and I can only imagine, I, I, I'm only a, a piece of that, 
but everybody is going and telling them the same thing about how they need time, they need resources, they need money, they need something in order to be able to accomplish their goal. So, and at the same time, you will hear your executives and your board saying that cybersecurity is their number one risk relative to their business operations. And that's true too. But if I don't understand how the dollar that I'm going to give you or the individual that I'm going to give you or the time that I'm going to give you to get something done is going to you know, manage that risk uh, in a way that is improving it better than this business or revenue generating project or managing the strategic risk that I may have here or filling out my portfolio of, of uh, products that I'm able to offer to a client or a customer. Um, if I don't understand how, you know, that impact is going to be greater than the revenue I'm going to generate on this side, then, of course, I'm going to spend my money where I think I'm going to get the biggest bang for my buck because as a fiduciary or for that company, I'm here to, as a board member, I'm, I'm looking out for the interests of the shareholder. So I want to make sure that I get great shareholder value and if I get greater shareholder value for getting this business or this revenue generating project going or filling out my product, then that's what I'm going to do. And I'm not doing that to be mean or vindictive. It's that I don't understand the impact that not doing this cyber program or cyber project is going to bring. So some important points. Uh, I, did, I think I just touched on this one, is that you're competing for a limited pool of resources. They can't do everything. As, a, as an executive, uh, on the executive management or executive committee or the board of directors, they realize they can't do everything. Everything that needs to get done, everything that's a risk, everything that's a product, they can't do. That's why they have, you know, uh, business acceptance committees. You know, they make decisions on what they are or not going to do. Um, so you're competing for that limited resources in order to get your program. So you want to be able to put together and put forth an argument and, and get those people in the room nodding, saying yes, th that this is very important prior to you actually going and sitting in that room. It, you can't fix everything at once. And, you know, I, I know, you know, we have a tendency of looking at things like, well, that's a risk, this is a risk, we need to fix that, we need to fix this, we need to fix that. But you, what you end up hap what ends up happening is you get that, I, I call it exhaustive mediocrity, where you are working on a whole bunch of different things, but you're not doing anything well. So as the CISO or the chief risk officer, it's your job to level set the expectation and ensure that you're focusing on those risks that are, are key, to your, key to your organization. Uh, technology controls without the associated business processes. Again, if those controls aren't embedded into your business processes, then they are not going to be effective and you still have that risk. So you need to be clear on the business's requirements for managing that risk. You need to understand where your program is relative to your peer group. Um, if, if, if you're behind your peer group, I can tell you at a board level, executive committee level, that's not a position that they want to be in. So the, the clearer you are on where your peers are, it will help you get that executive support that you need because they're looking at it again from their fiduciary responsibility. And then I, I believe they'll be making this uh, presentation available, but at this time, if there are any questions. Yeah, I noticed on one of your slides, folks told about the Monday morning. Yep. And the question was asked, how do you know the risk that you share? The reality is, the problem they have. Yep. But I've always struggled with how to answer that question, so if I can ask it too. And one answer is, we probably have. They seem very blunt, and they, they want to prove you're not being uh, a basis for it. Right. And then the alternative is to say, well, we're doing all these things, we probably aren't, let's find out how to do it. So, what's the right 
So the answer I actually gave was, again, relative to our peer groups. I said that, you know, it, for the areas that, um, you know, where, you know, Sony was attacked, you know, we're doing, you know, X, Y, Z, we have X, Y, Z controls. These are the same controls that we, that the, the rest of our peers have in order to manage or detect these types of breaches. Um, we are looking to do more things in this area to see if we can have, uh, you know, uh, a greater visibility to when things occur. But, you know, right now we are in line with our peer group and we're looking to do more. And, and that was my just <laughs> off the cuff response to him. But I, again, I went back to what our peer groups are doing because ultimately that's what, again, he was, he's on the board as well as on the executive committee. So he wants to know that he's not in breach of his fiduciary responsibilities. He's also concerned about, of course, making sure that the company is protected. But again, there is some type of, you know, you know, self-protection there. Am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? Any other questions? Well. I can see that I'm holding up everybody outside, so I want to thank everyone again.